So we're going to go through um, a little bit about the brain and then and what kinds of things we can expect after brain injury and then strategies. But as you know, <coughs> these are common questions that come up after you've suffered a brain injury or your loved one has. Now what? What do we do? It's a whole new world, okay? Um, for those, maybe most of you are old enough to remember this, and I date myself, but I always say it's like being in the twilight zone. It's like, oh my gosh, now what? What happens? What do I do about school? Do I reintegrate back into school? What do I do for work? Can I do my same job, or can I do a job, or should I do a different job? What kinds of things do I need to know, and how do I obtain support? And so what strategies do I need to use to continue with my progression um, and getting better? And that's the focus for today. In the school system, as we take children back from uh, out of the hospital from being injured, these are our goals. But they're probably your goals too, if you are an adult with a brain injury. First, regaining what you've lost. Okay? Uh, most of the time, our long-term memory is very intact. So what you knew before your injury is in there. It's just not in the same place it used to be. So it takes longer to access that information that you used to know or that's still in there, okay? Um, so we want to bring that back to the forefront and there's some ways that we can do that. Um, we want to continue our process of recovery and then this is where I want to focus for the second part of our talk. How do we adapt and compensate for the changes? Because some things will get better. And some things, because of the damage to the brain, are going to be the new you, who you are. But we can put some things in place that will help you be able to function in your life better. Okay. So as most of you know, our brain has billions and billions of neurons. And they're communicating all the time to help us function. And prior to the brain injury, you know, probably things are going along pretty well. You know, your brain's telling your body what to do. Your brain's telling you how to think. Your brain is helping you organize your life. And then you have a brain injury. And it's like having a file cabinet with everything you've known in your life that got knocked over. And all the files fell out on the floor. Mm -hmm. And... You're in the hospital, everybody comes to visit, and they're putting all the files, oh, let me help you, and therapists, and everybody's trying to put it all back together, and it's as if the files got put away in the wrong place. So they're in there, but you can't find the information. It takes longer to find it. So there's a process of reorganizing, and then there's a process of compensating for where your difficulties are. So I'd like to use this slide, and it's, it's not uh, physiologically correct, okay? But let's just pretend that that before slide is your neurons communicating before the brain injury. There's a lot going on, lots of connections, things are happening, it's working well. And then you have the brain injury, and afterwards, it's like, geez, some of those connections are washed away. And now it takes longer to find the information that you need. Okay? So I use the example of driving to Starbucks on your way to work in the morning. So you need that coffee, okay? This is, this is who you are. You need that coffee in the morning. And it was raining the night before, and you drive your usual route to Starbucks to get that coffee, and the road's blocked. Oh, got to get that coffee. So you go the next route. That road's blocked, too. And then you go to the third one, and by then you're like, forget it, I can't get my coffee. And you get very upset. This is what happens to our survivors sometimes, because it's really challenging, and if you keep trying and it just keeps getting harder, sometimes you just want to blow, you just get frustrated. So I'm going to talk to you more about how to help the survivor, and for the survivor yourself, how to help yourself not to have that happen as often. Helping an individual with brain injury is easier said than done. Mm -hmm. But it is simple. The strategies are very simple because they are concrete 
And if we do them consistently, we see results. The hard part is, it's unlike anything else we've ever tackled in life. It's not intuitive the way that we do these strategies. That's the hard part. Um, but what I've seen with my students, oh, many times for many years, is that when we do things consistently, there's a calmness that comes from knowing what to expect. And there's a success rate from knowing what to expect. And it helps everyone in the circle of that brain injury survivor. So, dealing with memory problems. First of all, please continue to remember these are organic, not intentional, forgetful things that happen. It's, I have to say this because, you know, we're human beings. And in the, in the moment of frustration, you're like, can't you remember? You know, and so I have to keep emphasizing that because it's important to know for the survivor. They're not trying not to. So we have to put a lot of different supports in place. You will continue to hear me say visual. The motor experience, hey, my towel example, okay? The towel example, a visual for that would be a picture of how to fold the towel or the towel already folded. It's a little visual cue of what you want to have happen. The motor experience would be picking up the towel and showing the survivor how to fold it, doing it together. That's a motor experience. And then, of course, repetition is really important, OK? Um, when I say work at the individual's proficient and instructional level, that's my teacher talk. But mm -hmm. sometimes we want things to happen, more complex things to happen. Um, and we jump too far ahead. OK, your first cue that's not working is uh, some defiant behavior some explosive behavior. It's happening because we've gone too far. We've tried too much, and we need to pull back. That's your first gauge. And for the survivor, too, if you find yourself constantly getting frustrated, we need to pull back and see if we can simp make it more simple, make it simplified, OK? Uh, and it, requires, it does require a lot of patience recognizing, both for the caregiver and the survivor. I often tell my families, the parents that I work with, please, and the teachers, by the way, over-compliment. Over-compliment the effort. These children and the survivor, adult survivors, are putting forth more effort than any of us who are caregivers can imagine. It's a lot of effort. It's a lot of work. And they need to be complimented for those little efforts. You see, progress is made in big steps and small steps. We all recognize the big steps. Yay, walk it again. Oh, you can eat. Awesome. You know, these are great things. The little things are almost harder, and they're not recognized. Okay, I find with my students, that when they feel appreciated, when their effort is appreciated, when I say, wow, I, and this word is a very good word to use, I appreciate how hard you're working. I see how hard you're working. The look on the face is worth a million dollars because they sometimes don't feel like people understand. And honestly, I have not had a brain injury. I cannot say I fully understand. I'm not in their shoes. But if we can continue to give that reinforcement, you will find more effort. Not because necessarily they're liking the compliments, but the compliments calm. Help the person feel calm in their efforts. Okay? When we get irritable and, act and and frustrated and try to push too hard, stress comes into play. And when stress is in play, learning goes down. We cannot learn well under stress. And guess what? You're already under stress if you had a brain injury <laughs> because you're working hard already. That's already stressful. 
every time you notice that I'm doing something right, it helps me remember to notice myself when I'm doing something right. Yes, excellent comment. And if we didn't hear it, uh, the other of you didn't hear it. The compliment helps the survivor know, oh, I did the right thing. Excellent point. That is so very true. So very true. Because the survivor doesn't lack of introspection. The survivor doesn't always is not aware yeah. often what's right that they did and what's not right what they did. We tend to focus like a typical uh, developing person. Um, we tend to focus on that wasn't right. Well, okay, fine, but how do I pull out what's right out of my head? I, how do I find what's right? It needs to be taught and told, and complimenting is a great way to do it. Thank you, Chuck. That was a great comment. <clears throat> okay, this is another simple and very huge thing. Consistency. If your routine is the same, in getting ready in the morning, in how you get meals prepared, or your daily routine. If it is consistent, you will see more success because the survivor knows what to expect. If I relate this to my students, some kids are okay with a little bit of a change. Some, some kids have explosive behavior with one simple change. Okay, one example is if there's a substitute teacher, that child needs to know in advance of going into the room, today it's going to be different. We're having a substitute. And then there's time given to process the information. Maybe five minutes, maybe more, because it might make that child angry that there's a change. And I don't know what to expect. Okay, I have one student tell me, I can't have different people. I can't have different people in the day. Oh, tell me more about that. I can't, I can't do it. I have to be this way with this person, then I have to be this way with this person, then I have to be this way with this person. I can't do it. So, wow, what good information that was for me. I said, wow. I said, you know what? We're going to learn how to do that. We're going to learn so it's not so upsetting. It <laughs> takes time. But I'm very hopeful that we will get to learning how to manage these changes. It has to be taught. Okay. Um, I have a, a student that I meet with in the mornings. And every day we talk about what changes are happening in the day. It's working beautifully. It's like calmness because I know what I'm going to be expecting in the day. The day is being handled by this simple conversation in the morning. This person's absent. This is going to happen. I'm not going to be here fourth period. The, the, all the things that are going to happen that are changes. And you know what we're finding? See, how many weeks into school are we? About five, six weeks almost. What we're finding is now when a, when a change comes up that wasn't planned that we had no idea about, he's actually starting to handle it. Because we're learning how to handle yeah. changes. It's being taught. How do we handle this? Okay. So it's very important. And it, you know what? I know how challenging this is in the home. It's very much easier to do this in the school setting. In, at home with family and people coming and going and siblings and spouses and children, it's not easy. But if you can think through the day and, and find as many opportunities as possible to have some consistent schedules for your surviving person and your family and write that down for the person and for you and for everybody else in the family, you will see a person who can manage themselves better because they know what to expect. Processing is a big word that it <laughs> covers many areas of the brain. If you have trouble processing things, you're good. you may have trouble with behavior. You may have trouble with initiating a task. You may have trouble concentrating. 
okay? You may have trouble comprehending what's going on and problem solving, all of these things. When you see these things in your loved one, you can just imagine, oh, they must be having trouble processing what's going on. Maybe I should help figure out how to help them process what's going on. So one of the things you do is you tell them what you want to see. Kind of like Chuck's comment about complimenting gives him a cue, hey, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is good, okay? Same thing here. Think about what you want to see and then say it out loud. Often we say things like, don't do that, that's not appropriate, that's so embarrassing. And you give the person with the brain injury no idea what to do with that. Yeah. So you need to tell them what you want to see. So in school we might say, hands to yourself or hands on the table, okay? Or instead of swearing, we say, darn, or whatever it is. You tell them what you want to hear or say. Oh, we have a soft voice. Soft voice, walking feet, all kinds of things. Describe what you want to see. That's the way to think about it. And then the person has an opportunity to actually do it, and then you compliment. When you're starting something that you want to have happen and you're not getting the initiation from the person or they don't seem to want to do it, do you have, does anybody have that experience where the person doesn't want to do it? Okay. Okay. I'll do one. Whatever the task is, let me do one. You watch. I do this with my students when they don't want to do their work. Oh. And I can see that it's not one of those where I can coax them into doing it. I can see there's it's not a good day for pushing anything. Okay, then I'll do one and you watch me. That's my, it has to be you watch. I'm not going to just sit there and do it and the person's not watching. So they usually like me to do one for them. So they will sit and watch. <laughs> so I will have the person watch and then I'll say, okay. Um, now, let's see, I'm going to do the next one. And, and I talk it through out loud. Just like I say to you to tell a person what you want to see, I start talking through what I need to do. Let's see, so let's see. First, I add the ones, and let's see. And I just say everything out loud, and I start doing it very slowly. Why? One, because the person, the brain, the person with the brain injury will start to see what the process is and then will start to kind of kick in as to what they need to do. It will jog their memory, right? I want to give the space for the person to think about what they need to do, all right? So then by the time we get through that second problem, suddenly that person is doing it on their own and they do the next one. Okay, there's an example for math. But can you think of an example of something at home that you're that you'd like to bring up, brushing teeth. Yeah. That was a difficult one that you had to work through. Yes. And so there's a lot of things to remember when you're brushing your teeth and to be able to hit every single area. So you might model doing the brushing for your survivor, for your loved one, and then talk through. First we do the back, you know, but all the different areas. Visually have a drawing if that works for your survivor, or the words of the areas that they need to brush. Have it visually represented. You both get your toothbrushes, you both brush together. On you, on your teeth, they're on that, their teeth. And then move off to doing it on their own. It takes time, it's a process, but it helps. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a calmer way to go about things. Remember, stress does not help us learn. It does not help it work. Please remember that when you change a task, which includes changing the language you use to explain the task, it's a new task. <laughs> this goes back to the consistency. And this goes back to the reason why I always recommend writing it down. Once you've come up with the words that help that survivor know how to do each step of something, write those words down with the survivor so that you who work with them or anyone else who comes in 
and the survivor themselves are all using the same language to complete the same task. Okay? It's sort of like looking at a recipe, right? If you get a recipe, uh, like on a cake mix or something, and it says, first, one, do this, two, do this, three, do this, and it's explained in language that everybody reads the same language and they successfully make a cake if they follow the directions. It's the same kind of thing. All right, it's very helpful. If you change the wording, you change the task. It's a new task. I mentioned about the cognitive breaks already. The brain is tired from processing too much information. Language is one of the most complex things to process. So long conversations are very difficult. Okay? Lectures are difficult. Lectures either in an academic setting or because you did something wrong. <laughs> Don't do that again. You know, if we keep on talking, you're going to lose the processing. And this, the, um, the person is going to have maybe some behaviors, but also be very exhausted. Um, I don't know how many of you have had this experience, but certainly with my students, oftentimes when they come back from having a brain injury and they are working in school all day, they go home and they sleep for hours. I've had students that just have to be woken up to have dinner and sleep all the way through the night. That's how exhausting it can be. And so we want to look at that and break things into chunks. We're all in a hurry to get better, but hurrying up and doing too much at once does not get us better. Doing it in small chunks, being successful, and taking the breaks when you need it is how we get better. It seems counterintuitive, but it's true. So what is a break? A break is not having a casual conversation. It's not a break. That's processing more information. Okay? A break is quiet. For some people, they can listen to music, and that's fine, because if it's music that they love, uh, it's the same music, and there's no, you, know, you know what you're expecting, you know the song, it's, so that can be relaxing for some people. It could be a walk. It could be getting, you know, going and getting a drink of water. Um, for each individual, it's different, but that's what you need to find out. What works for you, and take it. It doesn't need to be long. It can just be a few minutes. It just needs to be a break. So thinking about proficiency, I use this in school a lot because there's a big emphasis on grades. <laughs> of course. But it's the process of relearning and learning new things is the important thing. The process is the important thing. So each year as you're out from your brain injury and you keep working on strategies and you will keep getting better, we're just going to add on to that. A lot of times we want to go to the end game, like let's get this person working like they used to. That's just too big of a leap, okay? So proficiency is beginning to learn new concepts and then accessing the concepts you need, accessing the tools that I'm going to share with you in just a minute. Okay? And finding other ways to achieve your goals. All right. And then social interaction can be a challenge. Social interaction is very complex. It's about reading facial expression, reading where hands are, body language, your feet, your stance of your feet. There's a lot to process in social interaction, and many of our survivors have trouble processing all of that. It's a lot to process. It needs to be taught again. In order for us to have successful social relationships, we have to be able to interpret body language and others' feelings. And this is a challenge for many people with brain injury. They don't know how to do it. They've lost that ability. Can it be brought back? Yeah, some. It can. It has to be taught, though. Sometimes, I, I was at a conference and I heard this um, man speak. He lost the ability to read people's faces and recognize faces and understand when somebody was, you know, done with the conversation. So his daughter was saying she was, would go to parties with him, like family parties. And he, he really lost the ability. He actually just did not have it anymore. Was not, that brain function was not in place. 
So she would go around with him and she'd say, okay, Uncle John is really annoyed with you right now. And he'd say, oh. Oh, he knew what to do with it. He knew that, oh, he's annoyed. We better move on to another conversation. But he absolutely could not read his facial expression to know that. That was the part that was damaged for him. And his sweet daughter would go around with him and give him the information. Once he had it, he knew what to do. OK, be aware when you're coming into a social situation midstream or class midstream, it can be very disoriented for person with a brain injury. So you need to front load, we call it, and talk about, hey, we're getting ready to go in that room. And like at school, sometimes I might pop in, or my pep rally example, this, you know, it's going to be loud in there. I'm kind of giving the parameters of what's going to happen. So she didn't go in there and go, ah, it's loud. She already knew to expect that, and then came out and go, yeah, you're right, it's too loud. <laughs> but giving that parameter so that the person has an idea of what to expect can be also, I, I keep saying this, very calming because we want, when we're calm, we're able to function much more effectively. And I've already said social cues need to be taught. Much of our social information is nonverbal. Oh my, that goes right over the heads of some of my kids. They don't understand especially my high school kids and the high school teachers have a lot of nuance and they, you know, have dry sense of humor and these things and it, the kids do not understand it and they misinterpret it often. So we have to talk about what do we do about that. That teacher's really mean. Well, the teacher has a dry sense of humor and the teacher talks kind of loud and that's interpreted as mean, but it's not. It's just playful. But the boy doesn't get that. So I have to go through step by step and reteach what it means when a person says this, you know, phrase and what a person, I, I, I've had several times when a student's come to me and upset, oh, they're so mean in that class. Well, what happened? Well, in one instance, they were doing a group activity and there was a group of kids that were calling this boy from across the room to come and join their group. But when they yelled the name, he took, he's like, I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I said, well, what did they yell? He said, well, they said, you know, yelled his name and said, come here. And they said, oh. I said, you know what that sounds like to me? And then my famous pause, waiting for him to say what. <laughs> I'm not going to keep talking till I hear that what, because I need to know he's receiving the information. It sounds to me like they were actually wanting you to join their group. Oh, really? Okay, so they don't quite get all that. You need to read teachers, okay? We're looking at the context of the situation and asking questions. I haven't really said much about respect, but respect is so huge, even for the younger children, because they're working so hard. They are very aware of how they are different. And I approach them with respect. Tell me what you think. Tell me what's going on with you. That gives me so much information as to how to help them. When you're teaching facial expression, you need to, and I have done this in my class as well, what do the eyes look like in this expression? What does the, what does the, does the mouth look like? What's the neck look like? In this study that was done, I apologize, I'm not, I don't remember which country, but they determined that these people with brain injury, they can understand and say either happy or sad. All the different expressions that were given, it was either happy or sad was the response. But anger, frustration, annoyance, surprise, didn't get the nuance of that. So I'm just showing you this because it does sometimes have to be taught. I've said this before, but I just want to throw this up here. Remember, our behavioral problems are often physiological from the synopsis not firing correctly, not knowing what to do. So let's talk about behavior a little bit. Are we doing okay on time, Susan? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So it's not premeditated. Uh, some of you probably already know that. <laughs> because sometimes you can go from zero calm to 100 behavior issues in a split second, right? It's not premeditated. 
It is a response to the environment and the brain function not working correctly. So what I think is interesting is, guess what? It can be changed if not confronted in the moment. This is, again, counterintuitive. If you continue to get in the person's face and try to change their behavior in the moment, you're going to lose the battle, let me tell you because it only makes the person more angry. And those of you who are survivors probably know this. You don't want someone telling you to stop doing what you're doing when you're angry and keep trying to talk to you about it because all you're having to do is process more information and it just leads to explosive behavior. You cannot do that. We have to either redirect to something else or, like I said, tell what you want to see, model. Have students that have are getting very agitated. I can see the escalation is coming. I just stay very calm and I breathe very calmly and I wait. One of my students responds best to it. it's almost inaudible, so soft he can barely hear it. And I don't say anything else for quite a while. And I just breathe. To take a walk. Whatever this, you know, this these students have certain things that help. Instead of hitting the wall, use one of those squeeze toys. And I just wait for him to calm. Then we can talk about what is going on. It won't happen in the moment. You won't get any answers that are good for you in the moment. Don't even try. Don't try. Got it? Don't do it. It won't work. I'm telling you, it will only escalate the when people have behavior issues, it's because they don't, either they can't anticipate what's going to happen. It's like something new is going on. I don't know what to do with it. It's very disorienting and upsetting, especially if you have a highly functioning person before. Who wants to not know how to, how to handle a situation? That's upsetting. So it's sometimes it's that, not to know what to expect. That's why I say when you're walking into a social situation to kind of explain what's going on so that that person has time to get that understanding and then go in. Um, misreading body language is another reason for the behavior. Memory problems. Okay, so this is how you're supposed to behave in this environment. And you tell them. Two minutes later, they don't remember what he said. And this is a good use of our phones, our iPhones, our, you know, Androids, whatever you have. But eventually you want the strategies to be in there so you guys can review it. So the person can review, oh, in this situation, this is what I, what I want to do or what I need to do to, you know, to make it. And I teach people, too, to learn when their simmer point is and when their boiling point is. And... So we want to try to see where are they starting to get agitated. There's something usually that starts before that. It could be noise related. It could be because they don't know what to expect. It could be because they're approaching an activity and they used to know how to do it and they know they can't do it now. But why not? I used to know how to do that. That's where you have to start looking at What's going on before so you can catch it early and explain what's happening, okay? This is one of the reasons why um, I say don't keep trying to talk to the person who's agitated. I've had people say the record just gets stuck. I think all of us remember records. <laughs> it just keeps skipping. It's like, I can't get off of this. I just can't get off of it. They obsess about something sometimes. It's like, it's just, they have to keep talking about this. They have to keep talking about it. 
So sometimes that can cause um, them to have irritation if you're not if you're not addressing it. Have the person write down what's bothering them. Sometimes that really helps. A word or two that you can talk about later. Okay. Make sure you respond, but not over respond by having too much conversation. Does that make sense? Oh, I had a student say this to me too. Once I get upset, I can't come back. Okay, that's not at that what I call the simmer point. That's at the boiling point. If they get to a point of really out of control behavior, they don't know how to reel themselves back in. Yes, we have to keep people safe. Yes, we have to keep people safe. But we remain modeling what we want to see. Modeling the calmness. Security. Okay. Sometimes touch can be very helpful. When I've had student, one of my students really start to get out of control, I do a very firm, like a side hug, like it's secure here. I don't talk. I just breathe. It's secure here. I feel that that firm touch is very secure feeling for almost everyone. And then we talk when, when he's more under control. Sometimes you can just redirect away from the source of agitation. So this is a, one of those simmer point things. When I've seen a student just start to, I can see, ooh, this is going to be an irritable situation. I'll go, oh my gosh, I am so thirsty. Would you go get me a drink of water? Or, oh, I need that pencil over there. Would you go get the pencil? Or... Hey, did you see the Chargers game last night? Um, where do you want to go to lunch tomorrow? I, I, you know, you just completely change the subject. And sometimes that works very well. Um, because the person, is, it, remember, it's physiological, it's neurological. They're, it's not always emotional about the escalation. So sometimes they just need to shift gears. Please be aware of these things. Noise. Busyness in the environment, clutter, too much stuff around the house, too much stuff around the bedroom, too much movement, lots of people. That's really hard to process. I don't know who's coming at me. I don't know who's here. That can be very disorienting. And lighting, too bright of light can affect people too. These are things to be looking at. And again, don't flood with too much information. In other words, be quiet. Just say things a little bit at a time and allow for processing. My students that I speak to that need more time to process, when I speak more slowly, I have a lot more of their attention because they have the ability to keep up with what I'm saying. And that can be very liberating. So sometimes we get used to speaking quickly and then all of a sudden we've lost the conversation. I think I mentioned uh, teach what you say what you want to have happen. This is just another couple of examples. Um, somebody just roving in the school whenever they feel like it is not going to work out too well. <laughs> so we're not telling them not to do it. We're just saying change your clothes in the restroom. Okay. Say what you want to have happen, not what you don't want to have happen. It's just like when we do a, word, a search on the computer. If you say don't find articles about brain injury, what's going to come up? Yep. Everything about brain injury. The computer doesn't pay attention to the negative don't, nor does the brain injured brain. <laughs> it's really hard for that to happen. Always say what you want to see. Uh, retraining is the big umbrella here. We're retraining the brain how to behave. And when I say behavior, I don't just mean your attitude. I mean how to do things, how to fold towels, how to brush your teeth, how to get ready in the morning, how to do a job. Think of it as retraining the brain, giving the information and steps that the student or the, the adult can follow in order to um, complete the task.
cue cards are very helpful. These are for we use in school, and I, I just put these up here because it looks so simple. Remember to raise your hand, then wait to be called on, and then ask for what you need. You know, that sounds so simple, but these are real cue cards that we use because of the impulsivity. I need help right now. Okay, I had a student who always needed help with his math problems. He, the teacher's going, why is he up every, he's up asking me for help, every math problem. Well, we found out that each math problem changed function. So as long as there was a series of addition, he was okay, but as soon as it changed to subtraction or multiplication, uh-oh, I don't know how to do that. Okay, so we have to teach. First you raise your hand, then you wait, then you ask your question. And follow teacher directions. The visual is so important for that person to have the cue because we're not going to rely on the memory. Now sometimes the memory is intact. You have a good day. They remember. Way to go. Awesome. But we plan for the days when that doesn't happen. So I will tell my students, because, you know, some of them go, I don't want that stuff. I don't need that. It's like, no, on days you don't need it, great. Don't use it. But if it's not, if something's not working, we need to look at those cue cards or look at that binder, whatever it is that you decide works for you. It's a backup system. It's a backup system. The whole goal here is to help our survivors to move forward in their lives to feel independent in their lives as much as possible. And so this is a way to help make that happen. I mean, here's a, here's a few more. Getting on the bus. How do you get on the bus? Take a seat. Ignore whoever's annoying you, because this was for an actual situation. <laughs> and put in your earbuds and listen to music so you can ignore. You know, but it's step by step. When you need a break, you do, first you have to ask for permission. Then you go to the lunch court and chill out, okay? So, and then after that, you go back to class. I don't make these for the kids. I have them help me make them. It needs to be their language. It needs to be their thoughts. This is where respect comes in. It's not, you need to do this, this is how we're doing it. It's, hey, I have a way of helping this so you don't get so upset. All of them say, good, I don't want to be this upset. I don't want to not know how to do something. And so we work on these together. It's a dialogue first and then write it down. Numerous times I do have to remind people because I'll, I'll, I'll have families come to me and say, wow, he still doesn't remember to do this. I mean, how many times have we gone over this and he still doesn't know how to do it? And I'd say, did you write it down? Nope. Then I'll guarantee you, he's not going to remember. Write it down. After you have a resolution of how to handle a situation that is, has been maybe an ongoing one, and you talk about how to handle it, write it down. Okay, so I have a student that's really having trouble with this one teacher. Talks too loud, doesn't understand the um, dry sense of humor. So, so I said, okay, tell me what's going on in the situation. Actually, it was much calmer than that. And I said, so let's see, I don't like it when, and it took quite a little time for him to come up with this, but he said, when the teacher calls my name across the room. Somehow, these kids really don't like that because it feels like yelling. When the teacher talks in a loud voice, often teachers do that. <laughs> when the teacher tells me to hurry up, these are the things that make him very, very angry. So I said, all right, well, so let's think about what to do instead. And he said, I don't know what to do instead. There's nothing to do. Well, I have some ideas. Famous pause. What are they? Okay, well, let's start going through this. What would you like instead? What would be the thing that would help you? I would like him to come and talk to me in a soft voice. This came from him. 
I would like him not to tell me to hurry up because I'm not doing my stuff that fast. I would like to, the teacher not to get too close to me. I'd rather a kid send a paper to me than him walk over with his paper. Okay, so these are good solutions. Oh look, it's written down. We will get this into a format as we learn what things he needs. Always the resolutions are written down. Always. Because it, it's calming. For the, just to be able to see it visually while we're talking makes a big difference. Okay. Okay, here's another suggestion on agitation, the three B's. Teach. First, when you get really upset, first thing you do, be quiet. Yeah. Then back away. And you can, I tell the kids you can back away in your mind or you can back away physically from the situation. Here's my, oh, here is my, um, oh, these are conversation starters. That's right, for lunchtime. You know, because it's hard to initiate conversation, so give some tips to the person. Here, we're going to a party. These are some things you could bring up to talk about. How was the game? You know, or did you watch the game? Or what did you think about it? And then here's another key card. When you're talking, look at the person, smile. Sometimes if a person has something they want to say and they can't get off topic, this is where I say write it down for later. Make sure they know you heard them. You want to talk about your dog. We're going to write that down and after we finish what we're doing, we'll come back and talk about the dog. Okay? Using planners. How many of you have planners or use your phones or have a system for organization of your tasks and what you do? Good. This is helpful to develop if you don't already have it. And to have a section in where your, your biggest issues are, what the resolutions are, like that paper I just told you about. The big issue is what's going on with that teacher. We have our resolutions on the other side. A place for all of that to refer back to. Because when it comes up again, you can say, oh, yeah, we talked about that. Let's look and see what we talked about. So it's not you having to continue to have to keep bringing it up over and over and over again. Okay, this is the bad news. The wrong strategies can increase poor behavior, depression, and failure. But the good news is that healing happens for the lifetime. We can continue the healing process using the right strategies. In small increments, we will start to see more progress use the strategies and you definitely can make a difference in all of our lives by helping if you're the caregiver by the survivor learning the strategies. We here at the Brain Injury Foundation are here to help you move forward. So thank you so much. Thank you.